Hey everybody, it's Lisa Morton here to bring you a little vintage paperback joy since we can't have our show due to that stupid pandemic this year. Um, my topic is to talk a little bit about vintage horror paperbacks of the 80s and 90s and who better to join me for that than John Skip, one of these seminal cyber uh, splatter punks. Let me just read you a few of the books that Skip co-wrote or co-edited, usually with Craig Spector, from 1986 to 1992. The Light at the End, The Cleanup, The Scream, Deadlines, The Bridge, Animals, Book of the Dead, Still Dead, and the novelization of Fright Night. Did I miss anything, Skip? That's like nine books. It's an amazing amount of work, and these are like some of... I know my favorite vintage horror paperbacks, and I'm sure it must be weird to you to think of them as vintage now. <laughs> Not at all. I'm used to it. Oh, good. Well, I I'm to, vintage now. I wanted to ask you, just start off a little. I mean, I've heard the great stories about you working in New York City when you found out you had sold light at the end, but tell everyone else some of the great stories about that sale and how important that was to you. Well, I mean... I was working as a street messenger in New York City uh, for educated and dedicated a messenger service. And uh, I was on foot. I would do like 20 miles a day on foot going all up and down Manhattan, occasionally into Brooklyn, Queens and the Bronx and Staten Island. Um, uh, when I went to Staten Island, of course, I had to swim. And um, when Craig moved into town uh, about midway through writing The Light at the End, he got a job at the thing. He was a roller skating messenger now, um, which is insane. He, he would actually like, if he needed to get uptown quick, he would just grab onto the back of a, uh, of a mass transit bus and let him, it pull him 20 blocks sometimes. Uh, Cause he's like nuts. And, um, and in the course of this, we were writing this novel uh, about this punk rock vampire in the subways. It was an idea that Craig came up with, but I was the writing guy. Um, and um, so I had managed to sell a couple of stories to the Twilight Zone uh, and Ted Klein, uh, who really liked my stuff and had given me a letter of recomm recommendation that said, I commend to your attention the writing of John Skip, a young writer of unusual talent. I have published several, several of his stories in Twilight Zone magazine and look forward to seeing more. So. Um, Craig and I were trying to sell the light at the end. Uh, we got like innumerable rejections all over town. It was too violent. There were too many characters, blah, blah, blah. It was also written in present tense for the first 10 uh, drafts that went out. We kept hearing about that. So uh, then all of a sudden, Ted Klein sells uh, his uh, book, The Ceremonies to Bantam Books and an editor named Lou Aronica for $100,000. I'm like, shit. Um, Bantam really likes Ted, Ted likes me, maybe they'll like me too. Um, so I wrote a single page query letter uh, to Lou Aronica saying uh, uh, the light at the end is a, a high octane uh, uh, punk rock vampire novel set in the uh, over five days in the subways and streets of, of lower Manhattan. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Here's the hero. Here's the villain. Uh, uh, we have a complete manuscript ready for you should you choose to look at it. Thank you for your kind attention. Uh, and then slapped Ted's letter on top of that. I put it in an envelope, met uh, Craig at the Staten Island Ferry because we were both living on Staten Island at that particular juncture. Um, I handed him the envelope and then I went home to start retyping the manuscript into past tense on my typewriter. Um, all, you know, 500, 400 pages, whatever it was. And uh, Craig roller skates into town, goes to 666 Fifth Avenue, which was where uh, Bantam was located, went up to the 25th floor, roller skated up to the receptionist um, and said, uh, letter for Lou Aronica. She says, uh, is he expecting this? Greg says, I don't know, sign here, and had her sign his official messenger manifest. As fate would have it, about half an hour later, Lou goes out to lunch. The receptionist says, oh, Lou, got a letter for you. He says, she, he says what is it? She says, I don't know, here. So he takes it with him to uh, the lunch meeting with an author who never showed up 
And so he's sitting there in the restaurant by himself with nothing but the restaurant menu. Those are the days before cell phones, nothing but the restaurant menu and this letter, uh, this query letter and uh, the thing from Ted. He says that he was still reading it as he walked down the street and almost got hit by a cab, went back to the office and immediately telephoned me and said, I'm very interested in this. Would you send me the manuscript? And I'm like, yes. And hung up the phone, uh, called Educated and Dedicated Messenger Service uh, and told them to page Craig who was out on the streets. I took the day off to, to type and, um, or rewrite as they say. And um, uh, just informed him of what had happened. And then I spent the next, uh, three days, because that was, I think, a, a Friday. And I just spent the entire weekend retyping the entire manuscript. And Craig came over and was like uh, uh, penciling in changes in advance uh, and um, retyped the whole thing, dropped it off at Bantam on Monday, waited three of the longest weeks in human history, and then uh, got the phone call saying, uh, we want to buy this book. When can you come in? And so uh, went instantly from starving ass uh, street messengers to uh, uh, a couple of guys who would become New York Times bestsellers a year and a half later when the book finally came out. Um, and that's my nice story. <laughs> it's still awesome. I love all of that story. <laughs> is it crazy? It is. It's crazy, but it's also great. Um, and now you were part of this splatterpunk movement and how aware were all of you of that movement at the time um well i mean when craig and i wrote the light at the end was probably around the same time that clive was writing books of blood and uh Scow was writing his short stories and uh lansdale uh maybe was writing the night runners or something like that we were all completely unaware of each other we were just doing what we do uh, so, I mean, uh, Splatterpunk was a spontaneous eruption in the arts where, uh, where all the pieces had no idea that they were happening. Uh, but then as all of our stuff began to get published and released, it was like, whoa, there's something going on here. And, uh, it, you know, the, the story is that at the Providence uh, World uh, Fantasy Convention, a bunch of uh, uh, writers were hanging around at the bar discussing this phenomenon and uh, what they would call it. And, uh, and Scott just said, I guess I'll have to call it Splatterpunks. And uh, everybody laughed. And, uh, you know, 20 minutes later, it's all over the convention. And like, you know, a couple months later, we're in Penthouse Magazine and the Village Voice and everywhere else where they're using this funny word. So, I mean, that's how that shit happened. But yeah, no, we, we all we knew is that we were trying to write the stuff that we wanted to write. And uh, and uh, and addressing what uh, issues that we had with the the uh, state of the art uh, at, at that particular juncture, and uh, you know, just sort of going for it, and um, and that's what happened. So, talk a little bit more about what those issues were that you saw with the, the genre at that point. Well, I mean. Um, I was loving what King and uh, Straub were doing. Um, I loved the history of horror. I've been reading horror uh, since I was a kid, was introduced by like the Fontana books of great horror stories, the Pan collections of great horror stories, the old Alfred Hitchcock one. So I was steeped in my uh, Guy de Massapa and my uh, Poe and my Beers and, uh, and all these guys, uh, my Saki. Um, and uh, I loved all that stuff, but um, really, honestly, the, the horror stuff I was relating to most in a contemporary uh, 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 way was, you know, the films of Romero and Cronenberg and uh, the underground comics of the 70s, like uh, Last Gasp Eco Funnies was releasing like Skull and Slow Death, um, where uh, they were more counterculture let's say, I, I did not see a lot of counterculture horror wherein uh, the main characters were not a dentist and his family in a small town. 
uh, and then the evil comes from somewhere. They were uh, working class uh, or bohemian street people. Um, and, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, they fucked and got stoned and, um, and uh, laughed at Monty Python jokes and, and um, they, they, they were operating, they were into the, you know, they were a reflection of the shit that I was into, just speaking personally, you know, the kinds of music I liked, uh, the, the kinds of movies I liked, the kinds of books that I liked. Uh, and again, that's where, you know, the power of the words comes in because I, I really, really care about words um, and, and love the dance of language. So, um, but yeah, we, we were not coming, we were not coming in with our professorial jackets with the leather patches on the elbows. We were coming in in leather jackets and, uh, and, uh, and getting stoned in the parking lot uh, more overtly than the guys that were sneaking in in their hotel room. So, um, you know, just stuff like that. I don't, I don't know. Um, it, it wasn't really, you know, I, I think I can't speak for, for Clive or Scow or Lansdale because they're all their own uh, distinct cases, but uh, Craig and I uh, met around music when we were in like bands together as teenagers and stuff. So we had that, that, uh, that rocking, that jamming, sort of uh, mentality where you throw ideas back and forth and uh, see what happens, you know, oh, okay, so the drum beat is like this uh, on, on the scene, you know, it, it moves at this rate. And so, I mean, that that's really all it was. It, it, it wasn't like we went in with an agenda to, to stir shit up. We just went in as ourselves, uh, were witnessed as guys who were doing it the same way. And that sort of made us stand out from the crowd. And some people were very excited to see us, and some people were openly resentful of us being there. Uh, like, how, how, who let these guys into the party? And um, and you know, it all just went down from there. So the whole like loud versus quiet thing uh, uh, was not us going. Quiet is stupid. You should be loud like us. Um, it was more, uh, you know, from from our perspective, a, a lot of people who uh, were writing a more restrained version of horror. Uh, a more polite version of horror uh, and going, yeah, who let these fucking guys into the room? And um, and so that's sort of how that went down. And I always found it very interesting because we had a lot of quiet moments in our books, but what people mostly remembered were the loud ones because they were so much louder that uh, the quiet sort of recedes, the subtle recedes into, uh, uh, you, you know, into the distant din after the extreme kaboom of, uh, you know, the nice person's head coming off uh, or something. And I also wanted to mention the Book of the Dead series, which is, mm -hmm. I think, immensely important in the history of the horror genre um, that you, I, I, obviously I'm a huge fan because I worked like crazy to get into one of those books, as you well know. And you um, did. And I did. And it was a very proud moment you. for me, yes. And, um, Book of the Dead, how did that come about? Just a, a little about how, because I know Romero did not officially, was he involved with it in any way or? Okay, here's exactly how it happened. Um, uh, Craig and I are living in York, Pennsylvania. We'd left uh, New York City. We uh, were living in a place where the cost of living was much cheaper. I was starting to have kids, uh, blah, blah, blah. And uh, our agent calls up one day and says, George Romero wants to make The Light at the End as a movie. And I'm like, holy shit, because I love George Romero. He's like one of my, my art heroes and totem spirit animals. Yeah. Um, and um, just, yeah, I mean, talk about a guy who was making subversive art um, with a deep sense of a social uh, um justice, you know, a, a, a keen sense of the social condition. He, he was writing uh, satires uh, with teeth, with literal teeth that would actually literal, literally open up your uh, intestinal cavity. And um, so I'm like, oh, holy shit. And I'm over at Craig's house. Uh, we were writing something and um, the call comes in. Now, this is in the days again before cell phones. So uh, Craig's on his office phone and I'm on his kitchen phone, uh, which had the super long cord that stretched like about 
20 feet. So I'm doing 20 minute uh, tw 20 foot long pacings in either direction, talking with George Romero about making the light at the end and smoking a joint. And all of a sudden I'm like, George, I know a lot of horror writers who love your zombie movies as much as almost as much as I do. Um, Cause I love them more than life. Um, what if we got a bunch of these horror writers to do stories about what else was going on when the dead started getting back up. And he's like, huh, I don't think anybody would give a shit. I don't think anybody would be interested or care. But if you don't use any scenes from our books or any characters, uh, for scenes or, or characters from our movies, then Rubenstein, my production partner, won't have to sue you and maybe you can get away with it. And I said, I'll be in touch. And um, immediately, you know, Craig was on the other line. He's like, what were you doing? And I'm saying, I just thought of this book. And um, uh, immediately sent letters out to uh, uh, Stephen King, to Ramsey Campbell, to Scow, to Lansdale, to McCammon, to uh, uh, a bunch of people, uh, Ed Bryant, uh, the people who were in Book of the Dead you know, the, the, the whole crazy roster and just said, there has never been any post Romero zombie fiction published. That is not a genre that exists right now, but these movies are incredible and we all love them. What the fuck? So would you guys want to write zombie, not Romero style zombie stories for a book? And everybody said, Yes, why hasn't this happened before? I guess it's because they weren't stoned on the phone with George Romero. Um, so King was the first guy in the door. He, um, he sent me a postcard about a week and a half after uh, I sent my letter to him. Uh, it was a postcard uh, with a couple of, uh, of uh, natives carrying an enormous uh, um, grasshopper on a on a, a spike like they're going to go and roast it and uh it said uh dear john skip you have made me an offer i can't refuse i'm about uh 18 000 words into a, a novelette called home delivery would you like to see it and uh you can guess what my answer was <laughs> so uh he sends me the story i read it uh it was home delivery by stephen king and uh, he had his phone number uh, in the letter. And so I gave him a call to tell him how happy I was to get the story. And he was super nice. And we mostly discussed A, the story, B, how much we both loved uh, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, uh, uh, apropos of, not of Romero, but of other, something else that we really loved. And C, uh, how he was very excited about these new uh, hot dogs that, uh, came with chili packed already in them. And when you put them in the microwave, they exploded. So we had a great conversation. And then um, um, lo and behold, Scow shows up, Lansdale shows up, uh, all these people show up. We have a book, um, we send it in and it makes history, you know, uh, sells a couple hundred thousand copies and uh, which is not what anthologies normally do um, and, um, and sort of changed the game. And uh, again, I highly recommend getting stoned and talking to George Romero on the phone, which you can't do now. So I also recommend time travel. Yeah, unless you're really stoned, in which case perhaps it will work. If I get that stoned, I'll let you know. <laughs> Good. I've had a lot of practice, but it hasn't happened yet. <laughs> well, before we sign off, is there anything you would like to say to all of our friends who would normally be at the vintage paperback show with all the rest of us having a great time? I miss you. I, <laughs> I, I miss you. I mean, I'm in Portland, Oregon right now, so I, I'm not even in LA. Uh, and I, I'm sort of glad that I got out when I did just because um, it's easier for me to negotiate life here in Portland with a massively reduced cost of living. Uh, I, I, we have a grocery store chain called Fred Meyers up here. Uh, 
and it's sort of a, a Walmart sort of affair, but it's a, a more of a Portland homegrown uh, thing. I don't even go in the grocery store anymore. I order my groceries online uh, and then drive by at eight o'clock the next morning and they load them into my car for me. The only place I have to go into uh, aside from my house is my weed dispensary where only one person is allowed in at a time. And, um, and, um, and I buy gasoline and that's it. Yeah. So, uh, so I've been sort of skating through this, but like everybody else, I'm just dying to see and hug everybody and, uh, and how much fun would it be to go uh, back to that uh, vintage book uh, phantasmagoria where not only are there all kinds of cool horror books, but I mean, I don't think I had personally lived until I was able to walk down an aisle with like 150 to 200 uh, uh, nurses novels from 1962 all lined up. See, to me, that's living. Uh, the, the fair is so good. I mean, it, it, it's such a, a smorgasbord of every kind of cool book you would ever want to find and not just paperbacks, but, you know, the special section in the back where, uh, you know, the the hardcover that I guess was exhumed from a, a burial mound and it's going for 15 grand or something, you know, all this stuff. It, it, it's just so exciting. And then to see all my writer friends and all my reader friends and uh, run into guys like Bob Murawski from Grindhouse Films and uh, you know, all these people who aren't in the book field, but love books and uh, are also uh, motivated to gravitate there. Yeah, it's just, it's such a fun thing. Um, and uh, uh, I miss it and I miss you. Yes, likewise. I can't wait until this all ends and we can get together in person again and have more of these incredible chats because you are a little piece of history, Mr. Skip, so. Um. I, shit kept happening. Well, thank you very much for joining us today. And um, hopefully 2022, we will be back in Glendale for a real in-person session. So thanks again. I, you know, 2022, um, the great thing about Portland is it's a two hour flight and a $200 ticket round trip. Uh, awesome. So yeah, I mean, it's really easy to get back and see everybody when there's not a pandemic. Yes. So. Um, so yeah, y'all let me know when that happens and uh, odds are good, I'll see you there. All right, sounds like a plan. Thanks okay. again and uh, goodbye and stay safe, everybody. You too, and all of you.